table. Is there anybody who couldn't find the quiz on its learning? It's just called Eco Relationships Quiz. It goes right along with this. You answer the questions, keep it on your computer. Remember, you can't do it on your phones because there's some drag drop questions, and those don't work on the phones, right? Okay. So, anybody need help finding it? Everybody good? Cool. So, let's talk about ecology. And to start off, I want to talk about this fine fellow right here. Really the father of modern biology. Uh, this is Charles Darwin. Very, very famous individual. I'm sure you guys have heard of his theory of evolution before. Kind of looks like a scary Santa Claus. The big beard like that. Remember, times were different back then. People had very different fashion. Um, Darwin is famous for more than just his theory of evolution. Uh, Darwin was really a phenomenal individual. And one of the things that Darwin was really, really good at was understanding ecological relationships between organisms. Um, and since his time, we've recognized that that's a really important aspect of biology. Um, so what he noticed was that organisms are continuously interacting with their environment. Okay? Um, and he noticed that as the environments changed, the organisms with the necessary adaptations to survive, they were the ones that continued onwards. Okay? So he took a couple of pieces here to put together his theory of evolution. And one was the fact that the environments weren't always the same from you know, millennia to millennia, that things changed. Uh, before his time, people just kind of assumed like, oh, if there was a lake there, there had always been a lake there. Like forever, like as far back as ever could be, there had always been a lake there. Right? If there was a mountain there, there had always been a mountain there. It was just always that way. And through Darwin's studies of geology and his studies of ecology, he started to recognize that the earth had changed. And if the earth had changed and environments changed, then the organisms that could survive in said environments had to have changed as well. And so that was really kind of his big piece to starting to understand how evolution actually operated, right? Um, and we'll come back to that at a later time uh, because he really changed biology forever. Um, and since his time, we've really begun to appreciate the interaction between organisms and their environment. So let's take a gander here at some organisms in their environment. The first word I'm going to introduce you to here is ecology, which is the title of this unit. And ecology is the study of the interactions that take place between organisms and their environment. So you can use that to try and answer that first question on your quiz. If you want to jot down some notes, I forgot to mention this as we go, you're welcome to have some paper out. Um, it might help you later on on some quizzes or even the test. Okay, You're welcome to jot some down. I would just put down some of these definitions because I'm going to walk you through from the beginning all the way up to the end of basically organization of organisms. Okay. This is a photo that I actually took. I was, uh, I was, out, I was out snowboarding in Colorado and I uh, hiked up this mountain with a friend of mine and my wife. And uh, as we were nearing the top of this mountain, it was just getting more and more desolate. Uh, has anybody been out to Colorado? Yeah, a couple of you guys? Colorado's like beautiful. Oh my gosh, it's just gorgeous. There's so much wilderness and so much area. And, and you can just really get out and be out in the wilderness. But we're hiking out and we hiked, I think this is Loveland Pass. So we hiked up above tree line. So tree line is the area which the trees actually stop. When you get high enough in elevation, the environment changes to an alpine environment and there's no trees anymore. And there's this tiny little scrubby grasses. You can see them on there under the snow. Even the snow is not very deep this high up because the wind is just blowing so rapidly. It's just ripping it away. Um, but anyway, as I'm hiking up this, it just looks so desolate. It's like there's no life here at all. And then all of a sudden, uh, this jet just shoots up behind the mountain, like up into the air. And it's this big contrail behind it. It just looked really cool. So you feel like you're all alone up here. And then this, this thing here, do you guys recognize what this is? Anybody know what that is? So that's a snow cat. Uh, people use those to drive over the snow. It's got little treads on it. And uh, these people were driving up to the top of this thing. I'm sure to snowboard down. Like I didn't have that kind of cash on me. So I wasn't going to pay anybody to take me to the top of this mountain. But I hiked up there and it was really amazing. Uh, so it was kind of neat to see, you know, where you think there's no life on the planet, there's life. Humans, of course, are like everywhere. But if we looked closer, we'd find lots of things alive in here. And we'll do that here in a second. Okay. So let's take a gander here. We're going to drop through all of the groupings of species on the planet. So starting from an individual. 
An individual would be like me or you, right? If we jump up from there, we group things into something called a population, okay? So a population is a group of organisms, all of the same species living in a certain area. We have to define the area, okay? So we could say the, the population of humans in Columbus, or we could talk about the populations of, population of earthworms just right outside the school building in the grass out there. We could talk about the population of squirrels that's in the little forest over here. So all the same species in a certain area that we define. And I put this picture up here of Ely, Minnesota. Uh, I used to go up to Ely all the time. It's been a while since I've been there. It's a super small town, population 3,724 people. Um, and uh, it's way at the top of uh, Minnesota. So if you drive to Minnesota and drive as far north as you can possibly go, you eventually run into Ely. And uh, Ely is kind of the gateway into the Boundary Waters and the Quetico. So some of the most beautiful canoeing and, and wilderness areas in the United States and on into Canada, you can hop in a canoe there in Ely and keep paddling and cross right into Canada and then go hang out in Canada and go fishing and camping up there. I've been up there numerous times. It's, it's just awesome. But it always surprises me because you're driving through all this countryside and you arrive at this tiny little town that only really exists because it's a spot where people can rent canoes to just take off from. It's like its whole purpose, right? Um, but it's pretty cool. It's a pretty interesting place. Its population is very small as compared to a big place like, say, Columbus. Right? Everybody have that one? Cool. Jumping up from a, a population, so we go individuals to a population, we can talk about a community. And a community includes all the populations of living things in the area we're talking about. So if we're talking about the community of Columbus, we might be talking about not only the people, but the pigeons and the earthworms and the cockroaches and whatever else happens to live here and how they interact. Okay, that's known as the community. And I've got a little, we can look back through time. Here's a community of dinosaurs, right? Along with the community, it's also made up of ferns here and some trees. So all these living creatures are part of the community. So look at their interactions. A lot of these words that you're gonna hear, you've heard before. It's just that in biology, they have very specific meanings. So they're very, they're similar, but they're specific. So when we say community, we're talking about just the living things of different species that live and interact in some spot. Okay. Yes, absolutely. In fact, do you want, if you want, I probably got one in here. I've got a new one for you. Will that fit? Maybe. It's brand new. You can just try, you can just put it on. Yeah. Everybody good? Cool. So let's give this a try here. First of all, We've got a herd of buffalo here. Uh, some lions are playing tag with. There's the lions down there. There's a herd of buffalo. Uh, if we were going to define, say, the population, what would we define as the population here? What would be a population? Anybody, what do you got? Yeah, the buffalo are a population. So it's the individuals of one species. Or we could talk about the population of lions separately. So that's a population. Okay. If we talk about the community, now what am I talking about? Not just, not just these guys here, not just the buffalo, but what else? Yep, we're talking about down here with the lions. We're also talking about all these grasses, all these little bushes out here. Basically anything that's alive in this area, we're including in this community. It's one big community. Now, if we jump up to the next level, the next level is an ecosystem. That's a new one for you. From whence ecology is named after. So the ecosystem includes not just all this living stuff, but also all the non-living stuff. So it's like everything. Whatever area we're talking about, it's the whole ball of wax. It's everything. So it's, it's the rocks, it's the water, it's the air, it's the salt in the water. It's all those things. It's the minerals in the soil 
those all make up the ecosystem. Okay, so when we say ecology, we're talking about the study of not only all the creatures that are there, but also the environment that they're in. So ecosystem is the next jump up. Jot that one down in your notes, the ecosystem. Now, along with ecosystem, there's two words that we use to describe these living and non-living parts of the ecosystem. Okay. Let's take a look again here at the picture I showed you earlier, actually a slightly different picture of the same area. Um, there are abiotic and biotic factors in the environment in an ecosystem. So these words, you've seen this A before in front of a word, and you've seen this bio thing. What does bio mean? Life. So biotic are living things. Abiotic, A usually means like non or not. So uh, abiotic are the non-living things, right? And we can look at this picture here and we could maybe try and identify some of the biotic things that are living and some of the non-living things that are abiotic. So use those for your definitions there. Remember, this is an alpine ecosystem I'm talking about here. So I was talking about tree line a little earlier uh, if you look just behind us here, this is my lovely wife. My buddy Jeff took that photo. I'm standing in a hole, obviously, right? Over here, behind the trees, that's the tree line. So this is the area above which uh, trees can't survive. It's too windy. It's too cold. Um, so the trees stop. So what lives there has to change. Like the same things that live down here in the trees can't survive up top here. And it gets pretty sparse as you go further up. Anybody have those? Let's try and see if we can find some of those things. Here's a little bigger picture. So this is in Colorado. If you look close here, I know my screen's got a lot of pixels missing on it, but if you look on this backside, you can see uh, other people's tracks. These are all lines from skiers and snowboarders going down. There's not a ski lift here. You have to hike to the top of this. Hiking in the alpine regions um, to go snowboarding or something like that, it, it can be very dangerous. Like you have to be pretty careful. I was with my, my buddy lives out there and he knows about the area really well and he was, pretty aware of the avalanche risks and things like that. So he, uh, he took us to an area that was, it was somewhat safe. Um, it's still pretty dangerous though. Uh, you need to wear transceivers so that if you're buried by an avalanche, people can find you. And if you look along here, you'll see areas like up here by the top, there, these areas are avalanche chutes. So uh, if you're up there riding in this, it could be pretty dangerous depending on the time of day and the snow conditions, uh, you could be buried. Uh, it's it's real, real dangerous. So we hiked up this, and it was deep. I mean, it was we were post holing. It was over our waist deep. Uh, and when we got to the top, there wasn't that much snow. But like I'm standing, I'm well over my knees in snow right here where I'm standing. Um, but yeah, this was a, it was an incredible experience because honestly, just riding down through all that powder it was just beautiful. And like I said, it can be dangerous. The the day after we rode here, there was an avalanche. This is a road down below me here there was an avalanche right over here, just right over here, and it wiped a school bus off the side of the mountain in the morning, and the kids are on the way to school. Um, nobody died. Uh, there were a lot of broken ribs and broken wrists and arms and things like that. Uh, but can you imagine riding in the morning in a school bus on the way to school? It's still dark out. It's cold as heck outside. It's Colorado. You're going through these narrow mountain passes, and all of a sudden there's a rumbling and then everything goes dark as your bus does roll after roll down the side of a mountain and then is buried in its absolute silence. I mean, can you imagine that like on your way to school? It'd be pretty terrifying. And of course the avalanche uh, rescue team actually just happened to be that day, they happened to be training out here. Uh, and they just ran, they saw it happen and they ran down, skied down the mountain really fast and probed and found the bus and pulled everybody out and everybody was fine other than some like broken ribs and things. Um, I doubt anybody went to school that day. <laughs> I think that's a free pass if your bus gets wiped off the side of the mountain on an avalanche on the way to school. Things we don't have to worry about in Indiana, right? Yay. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it can be pretty interesting up there. So let's try and identify some biotic things. Who can tell me a biotic thing, biotic, in the environment? What's a living thing? The trees. They're part of the biotic environment. What's another thing? Humans, like us, we're, we are part of the biotic environment. Don't think that we're separate from it. Like, humans are a part of this whole environment. Like, we are very important roles in, in the environment. Anything else you might be able to infer but not see in the picture? What well, might be under the snow, even? 
there's probably grasses and things. I guarantee you there's voles and, and mice and things living in those grasses. There's definitely insects in the trees. Right? There's a lot of life there that you can't necessarily see, uh, but it's part of the ecosystem. How about the abiotic things? What would be abiotic? What you got? Snow, that's the obvious one, right? Anything else? My gloves, my, my clothes, my gloves, all that stuff's all abiotic. Sure, it interacts. Anything else? The air would count, right? Is that what you're going to say? The rocks, yeah, that's actually a really important part of the environment. A lot of minerals come from rocks that are used by living things, so even the rocks up here have a real important role to play in the environment. So the soil, all those things count for abiotic things. We're going to identify some of those when we get outside. Okay, now we can jump up one step from that. So what's up higher, a higher level than the whole ecosystem is everything. This is the biosphere. So bio, as you told me, is living, life. Sphere is like a big area, usually a round ball shaped thing, but not necessarily in this sense. So biosphere is literally every part of the earth that's living, that has living stuff, which is every part of the earth. Like life is so much everywhere on this planet that you can look in the atmosphere and there are microbes floating around in the atmosphere. There's bacteria up there floating around. In fact, um, we just made a discovery on Venus, I don't know if some of you guys saw that in the news, where we've discovered some biochemical signatures that could possibly be from living bacterial type things in the atmosphere of Venus, which is shocking because Venus is so hot on its surface that it melts lead. So these things would be living up in the air of Venus. So yeah, people want to send a spacecraft to Venus now, that is like top of the list, and check the atmosphere out, see if there's anything alive there. Be really interesting to find that out. The atmosphere, yeah. The water, yes. The hydrosphere, even lithosphere, the bare rock on our planet. You can go down into a bottom of a diamond mine and drill a hole. NASA's been doing this. Pull out the water that comes out of the rocks, and there's bacteria in there alive. Like life is everywhere on our planet, absolutely everywhere. So that's the biosphere. Let's take a quick tour of this here. This is from the NASA satellite, uh, Sea Star, and it's. Uh, it orbits our planet and collects information about our climate and about um, the ecology on the planet. So as you look at this, this is, whoa, sorry, you went too fast there. This is our planet throughout the course of the year, rotating around, and you can see where the snow cover comes and then disappears in the summertime. We're looking at desert regions right here across northern Africa. In the green areas where, where there's, of course, plant growth. Out in the oceans, the green splotches and the bluish splotches, lighter bluish splotches, are plankton. Here's a bunch of green down here off of the coast of South America, I think, is where we're at there. So a lot of this plankton's making uh, oxygen for us. It's a real important part of life on our planet, and if we lost it, we'd be in big trouble. So there's a, a really a living, like in a way, a living, breathing thing. Like is the whole planet is alive in some sense. So let's next talk about uh, it should be the first part of the quiz, should be good, right? And to the next part? No? Still a little bit more, okay. Let's talk about habitats, okay? So, habitats. Habitats are the physical environment where an organism lives. It's kind of like your house. And I put a picture up here of my friend, Mr. Toad. You guys recognize this as a toad? So I'll tell you a little story here. Toad, toad was my pet for a while. I used to live in a, a house that was pretty, okay, I was renting a house, it was pretty run down. Like to say the least, it was a pretty run down place. I didn't have a lot of money, I couldn't afford a whole lot. Certainly couldn't afford a dog or anything like that because I couldn't feed it. But I walked outside one day, one, uh, one evening, and uh, stepped off onto the concrete blocks that I had set down that were my stairs into my house. And <laughs> there right below the steps was uh, Mr. Toad here. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool, you know. I could use a pet, so I brought him inside and gave him a little aquarium, and uh, you know, there was a, we were out in the country, my wife and I, and so there was plenty of insects around, so I would always catch him insects and feed him insects. Have you guys watched the toad eat before? Oh, it's so cool, it's so cool. Uh, so he's not a frog, right? He'd be upset if you called him a frog. He's a toad, he's got dry skin. Their tongue's attached towards the front of their mouth, and when they shoot it out, it flops out and it's really fast and it hits the insect and it sticks to it and it pulls it back in. It's really, really cool to watch. 
Um, so whenever I caught an insect around the house or whatever, I'd throw it in there to his cage and, and Toad would just destroy it for me. It was, it was fun. Uh, but toads are really fun to watch. Um, their habitat's interesting. Uh, out in nature, of course, they'll, they live in, in, they like areas where they can burrow in. You can see that he's burrowing in there. Um, but uh, yeah, toad was, toad was a great pet. Um, I'd honestly, I'd, until I owned a toad, I had never actually watched one uh, molt. So as toads grow, they get bigger. And he started out as a wee little guy and he got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, they actually peel their skin off, their outer skin. It's kind of disgusting. Like he'd get in his water dish and he'd scrape at his skin until he ripped a hole in it. And there was new skin underneath. And then he'd slowly peel all the skin off his body and eat it as he went. But why waste anything, right? In nature, things don't get wasted. There's good energy left in that skin and the toad would, would eat his skin as he peeled it off. It was, it was absolutely disgusting, but it was fun to watch. Um, but anyway, uh, having toad was, was kind of interesting. I mean, I could tell you a lot of stories about this house I lived in. It was a pretty, pretty rough rundown house. I woke up one morning, and like I said, I used to feed, feed toad insects all the time. And uh, I had, my eyes were still kind of closed, and I stepped onto the floor, and bare feet, and I felt this kind of crunchy, sort of squishy feeling. Took a couple more steps, and it kind of continued. And I was trying to open my eyes up, and I'm looking at the floor. It's still kind of dark out. And uh, I noticed there was like some black stuff on the floor. And uh, sure enough, like, a whole mess of termites had just hatched out of the walls and they were covering the floors and I was walking through them there's no way around it I was just crunching through them as I walked through the house uh, and yeah you know I was freaking out a little bit like I love insects I love bugs uh, but seeing termites all over my floor was was a little bit much so when when termites uh, at least like once a year they'll release all the new kings and the queens to fly that have wings and they'll fly away to make new colonies like normally they live underground, they're subterranean, so they're in the dark. Um, but they come out every so often to release these things to go make new colonies. And uh, they're, they're just everywhere, all over the floor, and I didn't know what to do. So I just started scooping them up and putting them in Toad's tank, and he was having a great old time with it. Finally, I took him out of the tank and let him hop around the house, and he was just eating them everywhere. And uh, made my way out to the living room. In the living room, I found the source. There was a little hole in my wall. This is horrible. Like, I bet you guys have never experienced this before. There's a little hole in my wall, and sure enough, termites are just falling, like falling out of the wall, onto the floor. Like, they're just coming out so fast, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? So I think I grab the vacuum cleaner. I get the vacuum cleaner, because that's how you deal with ladybugs, right? And I stick that thing up against the wall, turn it on, and you hear into the back of the vacuum cleaners. I'm just sucking them out. Like as fast as they can come up, I put it back up there and just suck them all up into the vacuum cleaner. And that went on for a long time, like a long time. And finally I was like, this is ridiculous. I can't stand here all day and hold this vacuum cleaner on the side of the wall, sucking termites out of the wall so that they're not all over my house. I'm like, well, what do they want? They want to escape. It's a nice, sunny, warm day. They want to get out. You know, they want to fly away and find a new spot to build a new colony. So I'm like, well, why don't I give them what they need? You know, being a biology teacher, I'm thinking, well, they're probably attracted towards the sunlight. Like they're, they're looking for the light because they're coming out of the dark. Like, why don't I just open the door and let these things go free? So I open up the door and all the sunlight streams in. Immediately, every termite in the entire house takes flight. So now they're all in my ears and my eyes and all over my face. I'm standing on the couch screaming, like, like trying to rub them off of me. It was terrible. I had to get out of my house for a while. It was really, really bad. <laughs> I don't live there anymore, thankfully. But yeah, it was kind of rough. Yeah, termites are, are, are no fun. They will ruin your house for sure. They'll eat it to the ground. Um, but Toad had a great time. He ate all kinds. I mean, he ate. He was gobbling up termites left and right for a long time. Anyway, I had this Toad for a while. And uh, of course, uh, here's Toad with his, uh, with his um, Valentine's Day card sitting in his meal, mealworm bowl. He's eating his mealworms here. Uh, my, so my... My sister, about this time, I had Toad, uh, had a baby, my niece, and I told you a little bit about my sister the other day. And she, uh, she like most parents, is very excited about having her little daughter. And every, about once a week, I get a, I get a picture in the mail, you know, because I don't really do social media and whatnot. I don't look, get on the Facebooks and all that stuff. And she sends me these pictures, so I'll, you know, hang them on my refrigerator. Finally, I just get so tired of, of getting these these silly pictures of 
my niece constantly like my niece holding a new toy, my niece in a different crib, my niece smiling, my niece looking this way, but like all these pictures, I get the Christmas picture, I get the Valentine's Day picture. So finally I decided to retaliate with my own pictures. So now my sister got a picture of Toad for Valentine's Day. Since we did a Valentine's Day, we also had to do, of course, a Christmas card. So we made the Christmas card. Do you have no idea how hard it is to get a hat on a toad? Like, no idea. You totally think I photoshopped that, don't you? No, I spent like 13 minutes trying, 30, 15 minutes trying to put that hat on that toad and get him to sit still so I could take that picture. That's his Christmas tree. That was inside his tank. I've totally photoshopped the background. But the rest of it's completely legit. I put that hat on that toad and he was not too happy about it, I don't think, judging from his face. But yeah, so that was his habitat anyway. Next, let's talk about niche. Or if you're British, niche. Doesn't matter how you pronounce it. The, the niche is how the organism meets its need. Or you might write down the role it plays in the environment. It's how it fits into the environment. The habitat's where it lives. Its niche or its niche is how it meets its needs. It's like everything else. It's how it fits in. And I put two different creatures up here. Uh, both of these are native to Indiana. I think I might have taken both of these pictures, actually. Um, does anybody recognize this one over here on the left? Uh, no? You've never seen one of these. They're all over the place around here. This is a millipede. See his little legs underneath there? It's a millipede. The little thing out the back is one of his poos. They look pretty big poos. This thing is about the size of your pinky in diameter, but it's a lot longer. They're pretty big. So they're, you've probably heard of a centipede before. Right? Centipedes are poisonous, they're hunters. Millipedes like this are not poisonous, and they just kind of scavenge the forest floor, they're detrivores, they eat rotten, rotten stuff off the forest floor, they break things down. Over here next to the millipede is a slime mold. I showed you a picture of this before. This is dog vomit slime mold. Looks like mold, really it's a protist. And this thing kind of creeps along the forest floor, decomposing stuff as it goes. So, also kind of eats decomposing stuff. They've got a very similar habitat as far as where they live. Um, their niche is, is slightly different, like how they fit in their role in the environment is slightly different. Right? If it was too similar, they'd be in competition and one might cause the extinction of the other. Right? So where they live and is, is their habitat and the role they play, you know, how they reproduce, um, what they eat, where they, where they live, all those things are part of their niche, their overall niche, okay? You got that? So that should be the first quiz. The second question should be next. If you click on the next question, you will find something about relationships. Got it? Relationships, okay. We're gonna talk about symbiotic relationships. So this is the big broad category, the big broad term, okay? Symbiotic relationships. Pull that thing up. Pull that thing up for me, up here. Okay. Okay, so a symbiotic relationship, symbiosis, is just any close relationship any organisms have. And there's three big types of them. We're gonna go through all three, okay? But symbiotic symbiosis is the big broad thing, the big broad idea here. The first one is mutualism. So you can jot that down and look at your quiz that's on there. And that's where both species get something out of this situation. I put a picture up here of a really interesting mutualism. It's a three-way mutualism. So there's three different critters and each one gets something out of the relationship, something different, and they benefit. So the first here is these caterpillars uh, live on this acacia tree, and they eat the acacia tree, which you know is not necessarily great for the acacia tree, but, but they're gonna benefit from this if you, if you watch here. So the caterpillars eat the acacia tree, but the caterpillars also have little organs, little glands on their back here that attract a very specific species of ant that drinks the nectar that they produce on their backs. And the ants get something because they get food from the caterpillar. And then the ants protect both the caterpillar and the tree from any other insects that would come and harm the caterpillar or hurt the tree. So every single one of them benefits from the situation. It's a weird three-way mutualism. Okay. 
Usually mutualistic relationships are just two creatures, but that's actually three together. Let's look at another one here. Here is commensalism. It's a little hard to remember. It's a bigger word. In a commensalistic relationship, one species benefits, but the other doesn't get hurt. And it isn't, harm, it isn't helped either. Uh, probably the best example I can give you of that is Spanish moss. Has anybody been down south, like to Florida, and seen Spanish moss? Yeah, it's like really creepy. It's like hanging out of the trees, like a, some sort of like scary movie looking sort of thing. They're like, oh, I'm on the bayou now, sort of feeling when you look at it. Those are live oak trees. They're so cool with the big branches that come out and then the moss hangs off of it. The moss does not hurt the tree. It looks like it might be, but it's not hurting the tree, but it is getting a place from the tree to live and do photosynthesis. It's actually a type of lichen. It's not even a moss, even though we call it Spanish moss. Um, I found out the hard way that Spanish moss is actually full of chiggers. Oh my goodness. Yeah, you know, you do not want to take this stuff. And if you're cold and freezing in the middle of the night in Florida, <laughs> and take your shirt and stuff it in your shirt to try and stay warm, because like me, you're surviving out in the wilderness of Florida with the gators and everything else. Yeah, you will wake up more than a little bit itchy in the morning. It is not good to, <laughs> to lay in this stuff. It looks like it would be great insulation. Uh, it, it probably is, but yeah, not so much. So yeah, one is helped, the other is not harmed or helped. Which leaves us with the last relationship, which is what? Starts with a P. Parasitism. These are the creepy crawlies right here. Ooh, you might recognize. I put a bunch of human parasites up here. Has anybody ever had a leech before? Yeah. Are you allergic at all? Do you get itchy after you pull them off? My, my leech bites always itch. Like, I'm totally allergic to leeches. It's real strange. Not everybody is. Um, they're not a real big deal, you know. They're sloppy drinkers. They start bleeding everywhere when they start feeding on you. Um, pull them off. It's not too big of a deal. These other ones here, these other two, are ticks. Who's had a tick before? Yeah, if you live in Indiana and go out in the woods at all, you have had a tick before, <laughs> even if you don't know you've had a tick. We have a lot of ticks here. Um, these are fully engorged ticks, so they've been feeding for a long time and they're full of blood. If you take one of these, they look like little, little, little water balloons, they kind of are. If you were to take one of these and throw it against the ground really hard, it would explode and a whole bunch of blood would go everywhere. It's really gross, yeah. <laughs> The, th the things you do when you're out in the woods, right? You find a big tick like that. If you've got a tick on you that's as engorged as that, um, you've not checked because that thing's been there for a good couple of days to get that big, right? Most of the ticks you see probably on yourself are much smaller. Um, does anybody know how to remove a tick? Tweezers? Good. What'd you get? Okay, so you have to burn it. So this is really great. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah, most of us want to kill the tick after we remove said tick. And, of course, burning it is totally fine. Um, usually, I'll just smash it between a couple of rocks. Or maybe I'll let it go. I'm feeling, feeling nice for the day or whatever. Well, okay. Yeah, I know. I know. You know what? I'll, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what. I you think that's funny. I'll tell you a story here. A real quick one. Okay. Well, and before that, let me tell you how to take a tick off. If you've got a tick, tick-borne diseases are caused by the saliva that's in the tick, the, the tick spit, if you will. Ticks have a barb mouth part. It does, they don't burrow into you, but they stick that little mouth part in, it's got little barbs on it. So once they stick it in, they can't get out. They're stuck. And then they drink, right? Well, when it's time to leave, when it's done, it will secrete saliva to dissolve the area around the proboscis there, and so it can fall out and take off. So the old wives' tale of like light a match underneath its bum is a real bad idea, because what's the tick gonna do? It's gonna try to spit some saliva out to release, and that's gonna infect you with Lyme's disease or one of the other tick-borne diseases. So the absolute best thing to do with the tick is just pull it straight out. Grab it up there by the head with tweezers if you need, if you can't get your fingernails by it, and just pull it right out. That's really, that's how you deal with the tick. Super easy, right? So uh, don't go burning ticks or putting oils on them or anything like that. Okay, so the last piece here that I wanna mention is competition. Anytime two organisms attempt to occupy the same niche, in other words, the same role in the environment, there's competition. And of course, that can force one of those organisms into extinction, force it out of the environment. This happens a lot when we get a non-native species that moves into, say, Indiana, like Eurasian milfoil, or uh, for instance, the zebra mussels you probably have heard of if you go boating a lot. 
they destroy all the native mussels because they take over their niche, right? And they're better at it than the native species are. But competition also happens between members of the same species. Right? We're always competing amongst each other, whether it's squirrels competing for a mate or competing for food, right? The ones that are the most fit for their environment are the ones that win out and their genes get passed on. And oh, look at that. That's how Darwin's entire natural selection works. You can see where Darwin's thought process went, kind of how he put this together when, when we kind of modern understand how it all works. Okay, so competition is totally natural and, and it happens when organisms try to play the same role in the environment. Okay, that's it for that.